Dude, do you think your contact center is actually safe? Man, in 2022 alone, there was a 30% increase in the financial sector of data breaches. And this is like mainly contact center vulnerability contact. So like if I'm a contact center and I am not PCI compliant, what happens? You might go out of business. You might be fined severely. You might, uh, you know, lose customer branding, um, lose loyalty. I mean, enormous impact. So today we're going to find out exactly how to address that on this episode of Cloud Sherpa. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of Cloud Sherpa. We talk about all kinds of things from tech, cloud solutions, maintaining a biblical worldview. Today, we're talking about PCI compliance. Bro, I want you to talk to me like a caveman for a moment if I'm just getting introduced to this or maybe I'm just unfamiliar with all the acronyms because there's a million, mm -hmm. you know, depending on industry. What is PCI? What is that? PCI, Payment Card Industry, DSS part of it, Data Security Standards, right? Okay. Um, so basically, anybody that takes credit card information over the phone, um, DTMF tones, in other words, pushing a button on the phone and in, in putting your information, gosh, it, even on web transactions, all that. So you've got to make sure that your customer's data is protected no matter what. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then there's some severe penalties. Which is good, right? I'm thinking as a customer, whether I'm swiping at a gas station, a pump outside or inside, that's like you said, mm -hmm. if I'm like making an Amazon checkout or like call centers I've, and the ones I've been in this, I've seen different methods that like the one where the agent doesn't hear anything at all. Others where you only have as an agent two minutes or a minute to capture all the data, right? So they'll ask if you have your card yep. before they hit that recording. This is all falls under that umbrella, right? Yeah. So what, what's the role of this specifically in the contact center? Well, we're, I mean, we just talked about a, a massive amount of vulnerabilities. <laughs> like, it's a, it's, it doesn't feel good. When you learn more about cybersecurity, these things get scary. So how, what role is this played specifically in the contact center? In the contact center, it's huge because most people are, of course, you're not paying with cash, you know, you're not going to Venmo somebody in a contact center. You're going to use a credit card, right? <laughs> right. Um, so how do you secure that information? How do you um, make sure that uh, the agent doesn't hear that information? Because, um, I mean, not everybody's honest. Mm -hmm. And what if that agent wants to go, uh, maybe I could just, you know, slide a little something into that guy's credit card. He wouldn't notice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when somebody's on a call, there's different ways to handle that. Mm -hmm. And different software is going to handle it differently, right? So maybe it's going to provide white noise where the person is speaking their con or, or their uh, card information. Maybe it's going to provide, um, you know, um, some sort of tone over uh, that, or it just blocks out the call altogether. And the recording stops. The agent is basically pressing a button and that forces the software to stop recording and the person can speak or input their credit card information and then everything is secure nobody hears anything uh, the system doesn't transcribe that mm -hmm. if it does it might put x's over the uh, number in the transcription so a lot of those kind of safeguards are in place today with mm -hmm. most of the most of the contact center platforms that handle pci so they can help you be compliant but they're not going to force you to be compliant you still got to have regular audits and things of that nature yeah even on like the floor they i know they would just like ban having like being able to write on a pad which I think is like, I get why. The idea is that you don't want as an agent, somebody to be able to just scribble down someone's credit card number, right? Because I think that's where like the in-house audit happens, the in-person audit. But there should be like a technology audit of this too, instead of just trusting that the machine itself does its job. Like you would hope it would on paper, but like we've seen other, um, you know, 
interesting electoral ones that don't work when we expect them to work the right ways. Mm -hmm. So in the context of like the, the payment information, it becomes a major offset for the brand too. It's not just the fact that like you lose like the data for the customer and then you got to deal with all the, the recovery charges of that. But then it's like the loss of the trust, which you can't pay for fast enough when you lose that with customers. So like how, how, how do the consequences play into the non-compliance? Well, the fines can range anywhere from five thousand to fifty thousand dollars or more a month, as you know, <laughs> just from um, uh, on, on the PCI uh, compliance uh, fines. Um, but I think the bigger consequence is the loss of brand, the loss of loyalty. Uh, I think the stat is somewhere around like sixty nine percent of um, consumers that know of a large company that had, has, has had a data breach, mm -hmm. they won't do business with that company again. Um, or they may back off of that company and, and it's going to take time to build trust, yeah. right? Yeah. A lot of people uh, you know, did that with Target mm -hmm. when Target had a massive data breach. So a lot of people stopped shopping there. Um, sales go down, stock prices dip. Mm -hmm. You know, people get laid off, um, you lose brand loyalty. Um, that's huge. And then think about it this way. So how many credit card companies do we have today? I mean, like the main ones? Yeah. Uh, like four, right? That's like the main, this Visa is like the 900 yep. pound gorilla in the room, right? You got uh, MasterCard, MasterCard, right? Amex and Discover. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it. They're pretty much the big guys, yeah, right? Yeah, those are like the ones. So let's say... You know, Visa's 40% of your business. Um, you've got uh, MasterCard at 30% of your business. You've got uh, Amex at 20 and 10% of Discover. I think that equals 100. Um, <laughs> anyway, so let, let's say uh, just one of them. Let's say Amex says, you know, hey, um, you've had too many PCI uh, data breaches. Um, we're dropping you. You can't run Visa through your company anymore. <laughs> like if you lose Visa, maybe not the, maybe you won't bark if it's a you nil know, 10% from your discover, yeah. right? But like if it's a Visa of the four, that's... Yeah, so how many companies can afford to lose 40% of their business overnight? Oh, man. I guess this bleeds right back into the financial impact of it all, right? Like if not, if not being clear about your process on checking up, right, on that, how secure the system is and is it, does it, does it keep up? with what's happening in the now. Like I think about one thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago was compute, like quantum computing, learning how to like really break some of the systems that have already been in place for so long. So uh, while I'm not trying to jump across topics too far, the financial impact is what we're getting into. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I see it with you, the branding issue, the target I think is a good example. Like you can't pay for people to come back fast enough. So should like a, a, a situation like what happened with the shutdowns, that happened during a time frame where you're trying to build trust back after you lost it, that, that would be really horrible timing. <laughs> yeah, and so you're talking about, okay, do I spend forty to $80,000 a year to be compliant? Um, and what is my risk tolerance? You know, um, Am I willing to do that audit once a year, every other year? Uh, maybe I want to do it once a quarter, depending mm -hmm. on what my risk tolerance is. And, and how much data I'm, I'm you know, ingesting, right? Um, but the, the bottom line is, you know, you got to look at how much risk is worth the reward. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And this is also where, like, to your point on, like, being clear of how risk averse you're willing to be. Like, sometimes that, ha that, that goalpost mm -hmm. needs to sh change a little bit based on the way that like I think about this, dude. Like if your if your customer experience matters, and you probably should care about the security. Yeah. In twenty twenty alone, call centers saw forty percent increase in attacks. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. And then contact centers, when you outsource it, they still you still have that problem. Like yeah. if, I, if I said that offshore, they still need to deal with that, and then you're just offshoring that problem. Hoping that they don't ruin your brand. Yeah, I think we just forced a lot of bored people to go home and sit behind a keyboard and <laughs> find something to do. Yeah, which <laughs> let me go hack into a company. Yeah, right. There's a lot of Cheeto dust on fingers nowadays, right? <laughs> uh, from from people finding something to do. And then you got honestly, like the amount of free data on becoming like a, even a white hat 
hacker. It's just so it's so readily available that you just have to dip your toes in it to find out if not only are you competent enough to handle it, but where where that instruction comes from, because that'll also speed up your learning curve um, in, in today's market. So when it comes to like being um, compliant, then there's a process that needs to take place. It, like technology is going to be a part of it, bro. But then there's the process of it. And I think we, we kind of started touching into that. How how do I begin that process of assessing if I am how risk averse I am or willing to be? So I think it all starts with, um, you know, like we always say, stop dealing with direct salespeople. L look at somebody that's independent. Work with like a, a technology advisor that can come in and maybe run an audit for you. Um, and maybe not run an audit through their company, but use an independent company that's going to come in and do that audit, right? So let's f figure out, you know, where's the benchmark? Where are we at, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then figure out what holes we need to plug. The second part of that, I think, is uh, employee training. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, th there's some good cyber companies out there and, and a good um, technology advisor can uh, point a company toward different um, cyber companies that can, you know, look at the holes in your organization and try to plug those holes as, as best as possible. But they can also do the ongoing like phishing attacks um, where they'll test your employees, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe they're going to do the, you know, fr uh, front end pen testing, the penetration testing, you know, then they plug those holes, but then you got to come back and go, okay, is everybody still, handling data the way they should be are people clicking on pdfs yeah. that they shouldn't be yeah um are your uh your email spam filters and and things of that nature working correctly uh so there needs to be some ongoing training um because the majority of hacks come from just somebody clicking on the wrong thing yeah or like i mean it, it's like funny because it's not just limited to clicking it could be plugging up Sure. Right. Like, and then you have people who have different uh, approaches on how they talk about cybersecurity, depending if the agent is sent home versus they're still in house or they come back in house and there isn't any like reacclimating to why that training is important. Now that you're back in the office, hey, this is what we should be doing. So to your point on like the testing. Yeah. I mean, think of somebody's at home working. So COVID's a great test case for this, right? We sent all these call center agents at home. Um, let's send you home, uh, just open up your laptop, log into the software. Um, but what if they didn't use a headset uh, and, you know, somebody overhears and it might not be, you know, PCI or credit card information, maybe it's health information, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, they, they might have three roommates and <laughs> yeah. the roommates are working from home too and somebody overhears somebody, that's a data breach. Hmm. Um, and, it, and if that can be proved in court, that can be a hefty, hefty fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then this is dealing kind of with the way that we put people through our processes as far as internally. It's like a chain, it's a people issue that we're talking about now. It's training. Yeah. yeah. I mean, put, put some headphones on, you know, mm -hmm. don't let somebody speak out into the air over a speaker. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And then, and then setting those parameters in place on expectations too, right? Um, for for the agent, but then like there's also technology that can be put in place to help like facilitate these things too. So is there any like way that yeah, I know you mentioned like an independent guy would be able to help with the auditing of that, for instance, um, without having some type of you know l slated motive? Mm -hmm. Because it would really be it's like you know we do this with medicine, right? The third yeah. party testing is it's the whole point. Bring that other party in, unbiased, right, and then be able to come out with just the numbers and then like believe that the numbers aren't lying here. Right. So so. In the terms of the technology, how would you how would you go about addressing that portion of the process? So, when it comes to the technology, I mean, you got to look for: um, do we have encryption, uh, not just on the data, but on the voice? Uh, mm -hmm. Voice can be encrypted. Um, so, a lot of the go, going back to like the call center, you know, uh, platforms. Uh, You've got the telecom circuit that's bringing the call in, but that call typically these days is going to be VoIP. Okay. Um, so if if I can encrypt that, you know, uh, call and then 
when I transcribe it on the back end, mm -hmm. like we were talking about being able to block out any kind of uh, private information, um, personal information or data uh, that can be stolen. Those are the things we want to look for. Um, but we have to sit down. So when, when we sit down with a uh, call center, we want to go, okay, let us shadow you for a day or two. Let's see how you work. Let's see you know, what data you're handling. What applications are you touching? Um, if I understand all that, then I know how people are, you know, handling that data. And then we can go into, you know, how much care is put into the handling of that data, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if we understand that, then we can start putting together the, you know, uh, fences around it, whether that's building an encryption, uh, maybe looking at a different platform. Um, maybe you've got your call center software in house but you don't have the transcription piece of it may not be up to par where it needs to be today. Okay. Uh, so, so we can bolt on different applications to mm -hmm. what you're doing instead of doing a forklift upgrade on a contact center. Mm -hmm. It just depends on, you know, how you want to handle it and you know uh, how much money you want to throw at it too, because yeah, you know, that's a factor. That's stuff is, isn't cheap yeah and it's like that's why it's one thing we've seen with how many people have just branded ai on whatever it is that they're doing that people want they, they're attracted to the buzzword right and that's okay to a degree because i do think being on the bleeding edge and leading the pack is important but there's times where like i can see how and let me just use ai as the leverage here where i could use ai to both help me in the process of detecting fraud but then also there's a, the evil side of it where it's committing it <laughs> like someone set a program up to help hit you know what i mean and try to find a, a a a hole in my system a lot faster so what do you think is like the future state of the technology that's going to be in place with all this technology that's emerging so ai is definitely on the forefront right now right um as you know i was at techonomy um at uh the wave hotel in lake nona and we were talking about this with a lot of leaders in the industry today um, about AI. Um, and when we look at breaches, uh, what we have to be really careful of is like, there's all these AI tools out there today. Um, and even call center agents mm -hmm. have downtime, they get bored, mm -hmm. they can go to their computer. What if your call center agent is, you know, maybe trying to just you know, put together a better pitch, right? So they could open up ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. Maybe they even have ChatGPT4, right? Uh, the paid version. Um, so four can go out and scrub the internet. Um, and maybe they want to take some company data and put that into ChatGPT mm -hmm. and load that as talking points and then ask the chat to give it um, maybe, you know, use this information to structure a good pitch uh, so that they can get better. Right? Okay. Okay. You just gave away company data when you <laughs> stuck that into chat GPT. <laughs> so if you're not taking those prompts, and storing them somewhere, mm -hmm. then you could potentially be risking company data just in prompting some of these AI tools. Wow. So my point is, as a company, don't let your people use AI tools in-house. Uh, mm. Because otherwise, you could literally potentially be giving away company information. Man, I think if, if we could convey that to to the staff as well, like the frontline call center agent, they'd, they'd really be able to have a better grasp as to why the compliance stuff isn't just because the company's forcing you to do it or just because they're trying to make sure that they don't get fined, which is important. But then you can get disconnected from how the company is doing at times mm -hmm. when you're on the front lines, especially if there isn't good communication with the leadership staff to the frontline employee on this. Yeah. And, and so the te technological leader at uh, Deutsche Bank uh, that was there at the conference, he was stressing very much to, to make sure you secure those prompts. Um, but the CTO at uh, Medtronic, um, 
he was talking with us and uh, he, he brought up an interesting thing is that because these LLMs are at somebody else's data center, mm -hmm. right? That the AI is dipping into. So it's, it's trained off of those LLMs. So Medtronic said, you know what? Let's build our own. Um, so they literally stood up their own server in house and they're building their, they put all their company data into it and it becomes their own LLM. Mm -hmm. Now I got it inside of a box mm -hmm. where it's not going out to the internet. It's not, um, sourcing information that I don't want it to source. Yeah. It's sourcing my company data and it becomes my large language model. Nobody else's. Yeah, becomes the internal uh, Google at that point, right? As opposed mm -hmm. to exposing myself to the entire and if you go internet. the enterprise side, you're going to see a lot of that. But look, small and, and mid-market enterprises, they can't afford that. Yeah. That's a lot of money that goes in. These are expensive servers. Yeah. Um, that have to be really beefy. You know, I mean, we're a small business and we've got like, what, a couple terabytes of data? Yeah, easy. It's easy. And that's... I think even now so like i'm not in a call center environment today but i also it's just made me check myself on the data that i'm putting into gpt for instance just because of how it becomes a form of shadow it almost or like maybe somebody who you wouldn't expect to to do shadow it mm -hmm. is inadvertently by the processes that they're trying to solve for so that's like a bit concerning <laughs> it just makes cybersecurity a little bit more of a top of mind thing where Again, I think we include this as part of the journey process for both the the external customer, the end user, yeah. the, the agent, the in-house people, because it's not just agents. I mean, you got all kinds of levels of staff looking for solutions or finding and hearing about things and willing to, to dip their toes in, right, or to sign up for some free trial or something. And that's how you end up compromising, right? It's, it's through these, like, the holes in the boat. As I say, the devil's in the details, right? So doing these audits seem like something that's, probably wiser to invest the time in now to do before even just trying to add more technology on top of what you're currently doing. Yep. Definitely want to start with audit, train, and then assist and, and just continual, you know, like refinement of that. that. Refining it continually. So, I mean, dude, we talked about like, we talked about some of the tech side of it right now is what we're getting out of. We talked about reputation management as mm -hmm. dealt with this, the financial side, whether it's like a lot or a little is going to cost you. And if it doesn't cost you now, it's going to cost you if it gets compromised, which we don't want. That's the point of this episode. So, like, now what? From here, wh where do we go? Well, look, I, I think, again, it goes back to um, find a good, you know, technology advisor that you can work with uh, that will point you in the right direction um, and provide some guidance around it. As a CTO or a technology buyer, especially in smaller to mid-market companies, um, they don't have a lot of the big resources. So, you know, lean on those external resources. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of great advisors out there these days. You know, we're part of the Technology Advisor Alliance, um, and we kind of have a bit of a fiduciary responsibility between one another, you know, to, to work with each other and to help each other out. Um, but that fiduciary responsibility also uh, parlays into the client relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely find somebody you trust, find somebody that can uh, give you some guidance and, um, you know, help you do the audits and, and just continual, um, refinement of that process. Well, I think it's, uh, important to the accountability that comes with that, um, that financial responsibility there. And I mean, we do as business people have a, that responsibility to our customers there in a way, not maybe in stocks, but they're still shareholders of trust. Yes, yeah. look, so, Target can, can afford a little bit of a reputation ding, right? Mm -hmm. Small and mid-market companies can't. Yeah. You know, I mean, a, a, a reputation ding to a, you know, a company that's only doing, you know, 20, 50 million a year, that can be huge. Yeah. Right, and then there's so there's that concern the, the if a card cuts off you being able to process some concern, there's like just a lot of entry points. So at that, I think if we can count it all joy, right? Well, we encountered trials of many kinds. We certainly can, but I would highly advise anyone listening to this if you need some help, get it.
get it. It's not going to be worth waiting. Yeah. Until and look, P time. PCI is the tip of the spear, right? I mean, um, we're, we're going to get into down the road. We're going to talk a little bit about HIPAA, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do you secure that HIPAA information, all the healthcare information? Yeah. Um, you know, we'll talk about uh, probably even some other um, compliance requirements around, say, socks or fintech and things of that nature. Um, it's important. Mm -hmm. and, and it all goes back to, you know, your security posture. Man, well said. So on that, I think uh, unless we're going to end up rolling this episode into HIPAA now, we probably should cut this one and we'll, we'll talk about the compliance on the next one for HIPAA. Yeah, um, I think this is enough for one. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today on this episode of Cloud Sherpa. We're looking forward to having you come back. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We look forward to continue updating and really plain languaging a lot of this technological stuff as we continue advancing into the future state of where, where we're going. So till then, Luke 923.